just as as we know, this the, the economy is cyclic. So my best guess is that you know we have sort of stormy times for a year to a year and a half, and then things start to dawn breaks roughly in uh, Q2 24. If if I were to get that's like my best guess. Recessions don't like like booms don't last forever, forever, but neither do recessions. This is now the beginning of the new fiscal year for the entire mutual fund complex. So that's trillions of dollars that have to get deployed because even though you pay them a very small fee per year, you're not paying them to hold cash. You're paying them to make decisions and own assets. And then, as you said, Friedberg, the last part of this is now you introduce rate cuts and that's a real accelerant. Now, more than likely, I think what that means is that markets are set up to, to do pretty well, equity markets specifically. What is all of this saying? I think what it's, what it's kind of saying is inflation is very much in the rearview mirror. Rates are going to get cut by the middle part of the year. The economy looks like it's going to be a soft landing. That is actually very beneficial for the sitting president. It's also good for equities. It's good for us. Where is it going? It's probably going to 100, then 150, then 200,000. In what period? I don't know. Five years, 10 years, but it's going there. And the reason is because every time you see all of this stuff happening, it just reminds you that, wow, our leaders are not as trustworthy and reliable as they used to be. And so just in case, we really do need to have some kind of you know, insurance we can keep under our pillow that gives us some access to an uncorrelated hedge. So it's really interesting, actually. I think we've had a fundamental kind of now change. I, I did a little tea leaf reading on macro, if you guys wanted. I have some charts. You know, yeah. I'm going to just give you a little rundown of... Because I, I went and, I, you know, look, we used to talk about these things when I was... When we were doing a lot of forecasting going into this cycle. But so here's like a couple of really interesting observations. So the first one is... When you look at this M2 money supply, look how much it's actually shrunk. Now, why that's interesting to me is that you have these two forces that are opposing each other. One is we have these huge deficits. So we're technically still, frankly, issuing a lot of money, right? But then on the other side, we, we have QT. So when debt rolls off, we're not reissuing it. And the balance of that is still a really constructive thing where now you can see that, you know, M2 has materially started to shrink. And I think that that's a really positive thing because now what that does, it, it combats inflation in a good way. Unfortunately for all of us, it hurts financial assets, which is not so good. I think we've all felt that pain, but the reality is that that's been working. So then Nick, if you go to the second chart, so what you see now is like, we are in a really decent place with inflation. And if you think about what's going to happen over the next six months, it's mostly in the bag. And meaning, we talked about this before, but there's a lag effect on a handful of components, specifically rents, which when you roll them into this inflation rate, you're going to see it really, really turn over very quickly. Right? So we know that inflation is falling. It's going to fall even more. The second thing, Nick, the third chart here is you can see that now validated in these 10 year break evens. Remember, this was the chart we used to look at when we were like, holy mackerel, something's going to break in November of 21. I think we probably should have just sold everything we had in November of 21. We didn't do it, but <laughs> the point is now we know. And what you see here is the 10 year break evens are also telling us, okay, guys, we're going to be in a pretty decent place. And so I think the setup is basically the following. There's less money in the system. That's a positive. Nick, if you show the last chart, there's more money on the sidelines. And this is just a picture of, I mean, look at the amount of money in money market funds, six trillion and growing. So that's a really positive sign, which is that money will need to find a home. Once we rates have, drop. Once, well, uh, no, even just now, because you're going to, you're going to be in a situation where, and I'll get to this in a second, but companies are now starting to perform because they've been able to rebaseline against very, very lowered expectations. Right. And, and money managers have to do their job and deploy capital. 
and that's something we mentioned, I think, last week, but this is now the beginning of the new fiscal year for the entire mutual fund complex. So that's trillions of dollars that have to get deployed because even though you pay them a very small fee per year, you're not paying them to hold cash. You're paying them to make decisions and own assets. And then, as you said, Friedberg, the last part of this is now you introduce rate cuts and that's a real accelerant. Now, more than likely, I think what that means is that markets are set up to, to do pretty well, equity markets specifically. And so I went and I said, well, how can we see some data that proves that this is happening? And what's amazing is if you look at the performance of what I would call the most risk adjusted seeking companies. So those are tech businesses that have been absolutely hammered. What you see in the last month is they have gone just nuclear. Adyen up 30% in a matter of a week. DoorDash is up, you know, 25, 30% in a matter of a week. Datadog up 30% in a matter of a week. These are the businesses that were just completely decimated. So what is all of this saying? I think what it's, what it's kind of saying is inflation is very much in the rear view mirror. Rates are going to get cut by the middle part of the year. The economy looks like it's going to be a soft landing. That is actually very beneficial for the sitting president. It's also good for equities. It's good for us. So it's really interesting, actually. I think we've had a fundamental kind of now change. So there's Shamath on why he believes the Fed may actually pull off a soft landing. The combination of interest rates about to be cut with trillions of dollars on the sidelines by money managers combines to create a perfect environment to send asset prices higher. What will benefit disproportionately from this? Bitcoin, especially with the spot ETFs coming in early 2024. Now, here's Jamal's predictions as to where he believes Bitcoin is going over the next few years and why every investor should put at least 1% of their portfolio into it. I mean, can you play the clip in 2012 and 13 when it was at 200 and everybody was laughing at me on CNBC every time I would talk about Bitcoin? Um, where is it going? It's probably going to 100, then 150, then 200,000. In what period? I don't know five years, 10 years, but it's going there. And the reason is because every time you see all of this stuff happening, it just reminds you that, wow, our leaders are not as trustworthy and reliable as they used to be. And so just in case, we really do need to have some kind of you know, insurance we can keep under our pillow that gives us some access to an uncorrelated hedge. And it's going to eventually transition to something much more important but for right now, you're just getting all these data points that prove this thing. It's just the fabric of society is frayed. And until we figure out how to make it better, it's time to just have a little uh, schmuck insurance on the side. And everybody's running in. It's just an incredible thing. I could never have imagined it. Bitcoin. It is out of control. Like, look, let's, Can let's we talk just, Bitcoin. Let's talk Bitcoin. 2000, 2012, I was introduced to it. I started to accumulate, accumulate. 2013, I wrote an article. And so you're, hold on, just so, we, just so we know we can feel bad about ourselves, you're accumulating it at what price? Uh, well, my dollar cost average is around 100 and something. And, and you've held it, everything you've bought? Well, at one point, myself and, you know, two, so I was introduced to it by a person. I asked him if I could disclose his name. He said no. But he, myself, and another person, all three of us relatively well-known in the Valley, we went and we started. At one point, we owned almost 5% of the entire fleet. In 2013, uh, we've sold, they've sold, et cetera, et cetera. I wish we had kept it all. We didn't. Uh, it's fine. Um, but then I wrote an article. And I said, you know what? There's so much asymmetric upside here. This is a thing that either goes to, you know, at the time I said, roughly the value of gold. And at the time, it was about $100 a coin. And so there's very little downside. There's all this asymmetric upside. I said, take 1% of your net worth and buy this schmuck insurance. And it's a schmuck insurance in this kind of very elegant, beautiful I way. I missed that it. Was I missed the schmuck insurance. That was at $100, though. What would you, I mean, I, I, I actually started hearing from people that I know very well who, who don't often invest, who are now asking me if this is the time to, to invest. To buy the schmuck insurance now. Here's, yeah. here's the thing. This is now a confidence game, right? There is no real utility in this. This is a fantastic fundamental hedge and store of value against autocratic regimes and banking infrastructure that we know is corrosive to how the world needs to work properly. You cannot have central banks infinitely printing currency, 
you cannot have folks with you know misguided and misdirected monetary and fiscal well, policy. Done, uh, no. Um, so here's what I would say: the same way that I said in 2013, put one percent of your net worth into Bitcoin. I will put myself out there today. I think this thing is a hundred thousand dollars a coin, probably in the next three to four years, and I think it is in the next 20 years a million dollars a coin. So there you have it. I, what I'm saying is, you could buy the S&P 500 index. Buy 99% of that. So if you have $100 to invest, what I'm saying is... Put $1. Put $1. And, and the reason that $1 is so valuable is that it is fundamentally not correlated to the other 99. And just on the off chance that all the people that manage the 99 may not totally know what they're doing, the $1 may actually save us. So많은 미디어들이 금방이라도 2008년의 서브프라임 모기지 사태처럼 금융위기와 경제위기가 동시에 올 것이란 커다란 불안감을 조성했고 주가는 폭락하고 말았습니다. 엔비디아와 테슬라의 주가는 무려 75%가량 폭락하며 세상이 끝난 것처럼 공포에 휩싸였는데요. 불과 1년 반 만에 엔비디아는 생성형 인공지능 챗GPT의 돌풍과 함께 정고점을 탈환하며 신의 주식이 되었습니다. 뿐만 아니라 애플과 마이크로소프트의 주가도 급상승하며 나스닥의 상승을 이끌고 있는데요. 이 성공하는 투자란 역시 워렌 버핏이나 피터 린치가 강조하는 것처럼 기업의 펀더멘탈에 집중해서 외부의 영향에 휩쓸리지 않고 꿋꿋하게 기업과 함께 하는 것이라는 생각이 듭니다. 스트레스 <목소리도> Kathy, uh, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, good to you see you. Well. And it's Thank especially you. merry, it seems, for ARK because you're up 46% since, since Halloween, right? <laughs> And um, more than 70% year to day after a couple of rough years. So what shifts do you make here? Well, what we've been doing during the tough years when interest rates were going up and shocking the system, especially long duration assets, we concentrated towards our highest conviction names. Now that we have had a very nice move in the market and, the, and, and interest rates and inflation seem to be under control, we think we do believe we're going to see deflation next year and that the Fed will have to cut pretty aggressively. Um, but we do think we're on the other side of the horror show we went through. And uh, we think that companies that are comfortable with deflation as technologically enabled uh, companies focused on innovation are, are going to do very well in, in the next few years. Well, that doesn't sound any different from what you usually think. So are you going, right, are you going riskier? <laughs> yeah, well, Many people would say what we do in, in the downturn, concentrating towards our highest conviction names, is a risky strategy. It, it usually works out very well for us. We have a scoring system that really helps us along. Mm. Now we're diversifying more. Okay. And And, and we should, uh, we, sh we expect the IPO window to open up again. There are a lot of companies out there starved for capital, have been waiting for their liquidity event. Uh, so it's a good time to diversify and uh, and also to add back in some of the names we sold as we were concentrating, uh, perhaps because of more clarity uh, in their own outlooks.